Well, we saw the tornado coming in from the south. Our climate is changing faster than at any time in the past 10,000 years. All over the world, freak weather events are becoming more commonplace, resulting in thousands of casualties and billions of dollars of material damage. is thought to be soaring emissions of greenhouse gases, which, by trapping more of the sun's energy, are pushing up temperatures around the world. 1998, 2001, and 2002 have been the hottest years on record so far. climate is a global system powered by the heat of the sun. In fact, scientists estimate that the energy flowing each day through the Amazon basin is equivalent to over 5 million atom bombs. And that awesome power is held in a delicate balance. Most of it gets reflected straight back into space by the white surfaces of cloud and ice. The rest functions as a kind of pump, which drives ocean currents, evaporation, snow and rain. The warmer it gets, the more active and energetic the system becomes, leading to more variable and extreme weather worldwide. Simply put, it means droughts, floods and storms on a scale never seen before. And unusual weather events, like this prolonged cold spell that struck Bangladesh this year. Because no one was prepared, it claimed the lives of more than 2,250 people. In other parts of the world, we see failed harvests, disrupted bird migratory patterns, and the spread of tropical diseases into temperate regions. Since the 1960s, 10% of the planet's snow cover has gone, and the Arctic sea ice has thinned by 40%. Each year, this shrinks by an average of 34,000 square kilometers, an area larger than the Netherlands. The combined effect of melting ice and the thermal expansion of the oceans is predicted to cause sea levels to rise by up to one meter by the end of this century, flooding millions of square kilometers of coastline and threatening to drown whole island nations in the Pacific. In Africa, temperatures are also rising. Since the famous snows of Kilimanjaro were first mapped in 1912, more than 80% have been lost the majority melting in just the last 10 years. Climate change is a real problem. Uh, and among the worst impacts of climate change will be impacts on water resources, the things we care most about, water supply, water quality, and the risk of disasters, floods and droughts. Uh, and climate scientists agree that climate change is coming, that in fact climate change is already here, and we're not prepared to deal with it. We know that climate change is happening. It doesn't really matter whether it's been in, in, introduced by human action or by natural variability. It's happening. It's a reality. And we need to think about ways we can behave and, and cope with the problem so that people won't be impacted too greatly. One of the critical issues is, of course, this whole awareness issues. If we don't do it ourselves, the nature will do it for us. We cannot stop climate change. Uh, the pollution that is up in the atmosphere and that has started the change is already there and the effects will be there for a hundred years. If we were to stop all carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere tomorrow, the oceans would continue to rise, the air temperatures will continue to rise, climate variability will continue to be different. But if we don't stop it now, if we don't start to stop the emissions, then things will get even worse. In 
2002, Central Europe suffered its worst floods in over a hundred years. Two of its architectural gems, Prague and Dresden, suffered massive damage after the entire rainfall of a typical August fell in just 36 hours. Billions of dollars of damage were done and more than a hundred people died. In other parts of the world, however, storms, floods and droughts have resulted in rampant human misery. Already, the International Red Cross reports that during the decade of the 90s, over 600,000 people were killed in weather-related catastrophes. And during the same period, more than two billion people were left injured, made homeless, or exposed to hunger and disease. And this is primarily the poor, struggling to survive in the places that are most vulnerable to natural disasters, in shanty towns, in floodplains, on mountainsides. Well, the irony is that uh, the most vulnerable people uh, in the world today who are going to be feeling the impacts of climate change and climate variability are actually poor people in developing countries. And it's, it's ironic because they are the ones who probably contribute least to the problem. The greatest responsibility for climate change are those countries that emit the most greenhouse gases, those gases responsible for changing the climate primarily the richer industrialized nations. Since, for example, memory can, uh, from recall, we have used the climate variability, it's changed from a year to another. So the issue of what is the causes of climate change is, is, is open to debate. That is the reason why I say that we don't want to be, uh, uh, to focus our, our dialogue on the causes of climate change. We want to have adaptation strategies to cope with the phenomena that we are experiencing currently. <laughs> Bangladesh is one of the world's most densely populated and disaster-prone countries. In a bad year, more than half of its total land area is inundated, the devastation affecting millions of people. While these images are grimly familiar, what few people realize is that once the floodwaters recede, these same people are then exposed to six months of drought compounding all the problems of the floods. The direct effects of a disaster are the flood itself, for example, uh, when people have to be evacuated. But the longer term effects are even more crucial. So when the river is back into its plain, uh, people are left with no cattle because the cattle drown, the seeds are spoiled, and often they fall into poverty. And that's the long term impact of disaster that we more and more have to deal with and to prepare people for. On the silt islands of Bangladesh's Jumana River, Villagers make a precarious living growing peanuts and lentils in the few months that the river's increasingly erratic flood cycle allows them. Mm -hmm. We don't get water when we need them. We get a lot of water when we don't need them. India is a vast country. Nepal is also a vast country. They can share or they can have their own share of water. It is okay. But I also need water to keep my rivers from dying. Let the rivers live. Over millennia, people have coped with both gradual and abrupt climate changes by simply picking up their belongings and moving on. In Bangladesh today, through the worsening seasonal floods and rising sea level, the risk of losing the fertile coastal plains increases year by year, threatening an exodus on a scale never seen before. 
Already the number of environmental refugees worldwide has been estimated at 25 million, more than the total of all other refugees. Fleeing into adjoining lands, they remain largely invisible to the rich West. But a developed economy is no protection against the vagaries of climate change. Australia has been locked in a severe drought now for the past eight years, the most dramatic effects of which are the massive bushfires which rage along its eastern shores. But the biggest impacts are felt in the country's agricultural industry. Outputs of its grain and cotton crops have been halved, leading in turn to the loss of more than 40,000 jobs. But the world's driest continent is also a precious source of knowledge on how to cope with water scarcity. Deep in the country's hot and dry red centre, water shortage is a permanent fact of life, and the local people's coping strategies are finely tuned. Armed with the ancient knowledge of the Aborigines, cattle ranchers here have learned to read the land for water. Donald Holt comes from a long line of cattle ranchers who have prospered here for generations. But to meet the needs of thousands of thirsty cows, the Holt family realized that it had to first seek an understanding of their environment. When we first uh, came here, when my ancestors first came here, they were totally relying on the Aboriginal people to uh, guide them to water. For several generations we've learnt uh, a lot from the Aboriginal people, particularly about uh, how to observe what's happening around you and uh, where the water runs and when the rains come and uh, what to do uh, when it doesn't come. By applying these insights, the Holt family has learned to search the landscape for clues that will help them to collect and store the outback's precious rain. Dams like this are a great asset to us. Uh, we uh, read the country and see where the water runs, build the banks so we catch the dam, dig the hole, catch the water, and uh, even a small rain, a very small rain, uh, we can fill this dam with less than uh, 20 mils of rain, we'll fill it. Sometimes 15 mils will half fill it. It's never been dry in 20 years, even in a series of bad droughts. A keen awareness of the environment provides the Holt with the tools they need to collect and store water. The kind of awareness which can be cultivated and applied in many other places around the world. Africa. The continent that has the greatest food problems already is predicted to suffer the most from climate variability. That is, both extreme drought and flood, often one coming hard on the heels of the other. The flood that hit southern Africa in 2000 was the worst in living memory and left around one and a quarter million people homeless. While Mozambique bore the brunt of the disaster, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Botswana and Zambia were all affected. Africa's climate has always been highly variable and traditional nomadic societies learnt to deal with the changes by continually keeping on the move. What we know is that, in practical terms, we are observing, experimenting new patterns of climate variability in the recent years. And the adaptation strategies we used to have and which used to be effective in the past are no longer effective because of the current patterns are not known by our system, by our society. So we need to adjust to a new context. The new context, call it climate variability or climate change, that is what we need to do. Like. But we don't want our region to focus a lot on the complex debate on who is responsible for these changes that are taking place. A hands-on attitude like this, geared to helping people cope, is already paying big dividends. 
when floods came for the second year running to Mozambique, well-prepared local and national resources saved an estimated 34,000 people from drowning. In the United States, climate change is also leaving its mark. One community taking an assertive approach to solving its related water problems is El Paso, Texas. The growth of this small border town was made possible through the discovery of huge underground water reserves. For years, El Paso's future seemed secure. But today, with rainfall patterns disrupted and the city's population having mushroomed to 1.5 million people, crisis is at hand. Keen to ensure that El Paso's growing population has enough water for the future, the city fathers have established a core of water police to inspect neighborhoods and businesses in and around the city and to prosecute water hogs. Here in El Paso City and County, the most precious resource we have is water. Um, I'm here because the area to my left has been blatantly watered to the point where water is flowing onto the street. Um, this could have been irrigated a little differently. I'm filming evidence to present it into a court of law. Um, because most likely a citation will be issued in this circumstance. All the major cities along America's west coast are facing similar shortages. In Los Angeles, demand for water is expected to grow by 20% in the next 10 years, just through population growth. In order for LA to meet this increased demand with shrinking supplies, the city has stepped up its conservation and recycling efforts. A program to distribute free low-flush toilets has penetrated more than 7,000 homes. Recycling programs are sending reclaimed water to parks and gardens all over the city. Through these combined efforts, the city hopes to use 10% less water by the year 2010, despite a growing population. In the long term, however, the only way to tackle the bigger problems of climate change will be to find ways of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The Kyoto Protocol was drafted in 1997 to do just that. Its modest aim was to get the richer nations of the world to cut greenhouse gas emissions by around 5% over the next decade. Although but a first token step, in 2001, the United States pulled out of the agreement, arguing that it would have too great an impact on its economy. And the US is not alone. Several other developed countries like Australia and Japan have yet to ratify the protocol. And many countries that have ratified Kyoto have failed to meet their reduction targets. The Kyoto Protocol is supposed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's supposed to help us reduce the rate of climate change. Uh, and if we don't implement the Kyoto Protocol, if we don't begin to reduce greenhouse gases, then the implications of climate change, the impacts of climate change, are going to come much faster and they're going to be much more severe. The prerequisite to that is that the nations have to understand the nature of the problem and be willing to engage it. And unfortunately, as my own country uh, is showing this particular administration, they're not really willing to do that. The nations who are refusing to cooperate are mostly refusing to cooperate on the mitigation aspect. But um, we, we know that uh, Canada has recently agreed to that, and we are hoping Russia would agree to that. And then we'll fulfill the minimum requirement to bring Kyoto Protocol under enforcement. Still, that leaves the major polluter, which is the United States. But uh, I believe good senses will prevail. Something has to be done under the existing protocol to stop the emissions, to, to stop things from getting worse. But more than that, we have to start acting now to introduce 
new adaptation techniques to build a resilience to deal with the climate change that's inevitable. One country with a long history of adapting to the ever-changing demands of water and climate is the Netherlands. After the uh, international water managers um, identified the issue, the Netherlands government came forward um, as an interested party to support financially, because the Netherlands, as we say, is a man-made country. Man-made in the sense that we've always been fighting water, we've always been facing floods. So the Netherlands government f uh, found that it was uh, having something to offer from its own experience, but it also had to support victims of increasing climate variability and change. Without coastal dunes and river dikes, two-thirds of the Netherlands would be flooded at times of high water. For centuries, the response was to build higher and stronger dikes, barrages and sea walls. But since the nearly disastrous floods of 93 and 95, the Dutch relationship with water has entered a new era. With climate change bringing more rainfall and river runoff in the coming years, water managers are looking for alternatives to larger and ever more expensive engineering works. The solution lies in finding ways to adapt and harness the natural processes involved. This impulse to work on new adaptation strategies has recently been given international scope with the establishment of the Netherlands Red Cross Climate Centre. I think the main reason why this centre was established by the Netherlands Red Cross is a combination of factors. Our country is below sea level, so we know the strength of the ocean and the seas. We are living in the delta, so we realize the impacts of rivers on our daily lives. And we have, by our history, a strong connection with the world, the international world around us, and developing countries in particular. Vietnam's long exposed coastline has meant it has had a long history of floods and storms. Eight to ten typhoons batter its fragile coastal defences each year, bringing misery to the 70 million people living here. <laughs> Nguyen T. Bat is 65 years old and she remembers a time when the storms were not as bad. Two years ago, a typhoon breached this sea wall, drowning her village and farmland. Since then, a new dike has been built and the villagers have been resettled in new houses built on higher ground. By monitoring water levels and weather systems, local authorities are increasingly able to warn local people of impending disaster before it strikes. While dikes are effective in the short term, coasts will get much better long-term protection through harnessing the natural shore building processes and restoring the natural balance. With this in mind, the Red Cross have replanted mangroves along a 100-kilometer stretch of coastline, providing multiple benefits to the local communities. 
tôi tên là Phan Thế Quyền, làm đội trưởng bảo vệ cái rừng ngập mặn do Hội chữ thập đỏ tài trợ cho xã Giao An, huyện Giao Thủy, tỉnh Nam Định. Công việc của chúng tôi hàng ngày là có trách nhiệm tức là trông nom quản lý hơn một nghìn gần một nghìn hecta tác dụng của cái cây này là khi mà nó đã phát triển lên rồi thì nó có tác dụng thứ nhất là nó phòng ngừa sóng báo sóng và gió báo để bảo vệ đê điều rồi là mùa màng rồi là tính mạng và tài sản của dân và so you can imagine that this here is a mangrove and it fall down so if it fall down like this fall down like this it can grow up. So the mangrove can be automatically growth without the uh, manpower. As well as giving the communities physical protection from typhoons, these mangroves are also prime breeding grounds for fish, shrimps and mollusks, which in turn revitalizes the fishing industry along the whole coast. To cap it all, the whole project also more than pays for itself. The $1 million investment has cut dike maintenance costs by $7 million per year. But adaptation strategies can only work effectively if reliable predictions can be made of future weather conditions. Envisat is one of a new generation of tools that is making a whole new form of climate forecasting possible. For the first time, detailed measurements can be taken on a planetary scale. Launched by the European Space Agency, this is the most powerful Earth observation satellite ever built. Envisat's biggest asset is that it can observe and monitor the interactions that occur between oceans and atmosphere, between atmosphere and land, and between land and ocean. It is very important to see what effects trace gases that pollute our atmosphere have on the climate, but it is also important to get a good picture of ocean circulation and how ocean and land surfaces do interact with one another. That is only possible with a very uh, refined suite of instruments that comprehensively monitor our environment as a whole. Unlike ground stations, satellite can independently from political constraints or from adverse weather conditions look at the Earth at any time. Also, satellites have uh, the possibility to provide very stable measurements. That means measurements over a long time span are comparable and are not subject to any changes in the measurement itself. These eyes in the sky are giving us an unparalleled insight into the workings of the Earth's climate system, allowing informed decisions to be made in the event of calamity. In the summer of 2002, Europe was hit by a series of crippling storms, the worst in centuries. And Envisat played a central role in coordinating the rescue efforts. The flooding in Czechoslovakia, Austria and Germany, the famous Elbe flooding, used our satellite data in order not only to help with relief, uh, but also for future preventions to use the information in, against catastrophes. The data produced was in fact so detailed that insurance companies were able to accurately assess the validity of individual claims and even the extent of the damage done. Following up Envisat, the satellite with which we comprehensively try to understand how our climate functions, we have a suite of dedicated satellites which are called the Earth Explorers. In the framework of ESA's Living Planet program that follows up Envisat, we try to analyze specific features of our climate with these specific satellites, like for instance the development of global ice sheets in the polar regions and on Greenland. 
It is currently estimated that all our continental ice sheets taken together would amount to 28 million cubic kilometers of ice. Now, if that ice were to melt, the sea level would rise globally about by 65 meters. And it is very clear that we need to look at the ice sheets as a prime climate indicator, knowing that in the last century, our climate has warmed by about 0.6 degrees. The hopes of understanding these processes better lie with Cryosat, the first of the Earth Explorer satellites to be launched. Although scientists agree that the Earth is warming, it is very difficult to predict what effect this will have on polar ice, and so how this might affect climate regulation and the height of the sea level. Cryosat is a satellite which is dedicated to the analysis of ice sheets, not only those floating in the water in the Arctic, but also those on land in the Antarctic and in Greenland, for instance. What we are trying to do with Cryosat with a very specific set of radar altimeters that can work in different modes is try to measure the thickness of ice sheets and their variations. During the course of three years of detailed measurements, Cryosat hopes to be able to establish whether the polar ice sheets are thinning or not, giving us clues to the reasons for the recent collapse of major ice shelves in both the Arctic and Antarctic. Solid features that had until now remained stable for thousands of years. A good example is the Larsen ice shelf. This was one of the very first jobs of Envisat after its instruments had been switched on in spring 2002. Envisat was able, with the synthetic aperture radar, the ASAR, to observe how the Larsen ice shelf slowly disintegrated in the Antarctic. And here again, we have a very good example where we can see how our nature and environment behave in response to climate change. Scientific consensus predicts a sea level rise of up to one meter over the next 100 years, affecting more than 80 million people around the world. And it's largely the result of warming oceans. But climate change is known to influence not only ocean temperatures, but also salinity and the flow of currents. And how all this will impact a rise in sea level can only be established by taking measurements from space. There is no other means to measure the rising sea level as accurately as we can do it with satellites. Our radar altimeter, or Envisat, for instance, gives us the sea level to an accuracy of two centimeters, which is not possible to measure with tight gauges on the surface. For the first time, meaningful predictions can be made on how changes in one part of the world will affect others allowing informed decisions to be made about how to protect the most vulnerable on Earth against the increasingly erratic and violent weather of the coming years. The forecasting tools that are available are part of the good news because uh, one of the things that we have discovered through the dialogue on water and climate is that more and more forecasting tools are, are available not only for short-term weather forecasts, but medium-term and longer-term, which will allow farmers and water managers to plan by season instead of uh, being subject to, to last-minute surprises. The state of the art in seasonal forecasting has improved tremendously over the last 20 years. In 1982, there was a big El Nino, and people didn't know it until it was over. Nowadays, we follow the state of El Nino on the Internet in real time. Every Monday morning, I can go look. And uh, predictions of El Nino are accurate to about six or nine months ahead of time already. El Nino was named by people who fish off the western coast of Central America to refer to the warm current that invades their coastal waters around Christmas time. In time, scientists realized that this warming was having effects on the weather all over the world, bringing droughts to Asia and devastating floods to the Americas. Once these effects were modeled on a computer, meaningful weather predictions for whole regions of the Earth could be made months in advance, so-called seasonal forecasts. 
and every year these forecasts are improving. Peru is a good example of how seasonal forecasting can work for the people. In 1997 there was a big El Nino, this was clear in August, September. And people in Peru knew this and they knew that in the winter, in January, December, there would be big floods in that area. They prepared for it, they cleared, cleared their drainage ditches, they repaired their roofs. And in disaster it's not only the weather, it's the weather plus whether you are prepared for it or not. Along with El Nino, other regional phenomena affecting weather more directly in Europe, Africa and Asia have also been identified, such as climatic oscillations in the Indian and Atlantic Oceans and pulses in sea ice around Antarctica. And here, satellites may shed light on another recently discovered phenomena an accelerating vortex of winds which are dragging rain away from Australia into the Southern Ocean, threatening the country with permanent drought. While the phenomena is being attributed to global warming, a true picture can only be formed by taking consistent measurements over time. To get a good overview of climate change, one does need, above all, long time series of stable measurements in order to see changes that occur in our climate. Also, one has to see environment and climate from an overviewing position, and nothing else can do it so well as a satellite. The forecasting tools are becoming more effective all the time as, as the science develops and the modelling techniques develop. But they will never be perfect, there will always be uncertainty. And that's one of the key issues with the climate change debate, that you will never have a perfect answer. And if we wait until we are certain, it's too late. At the University of Columbia in New York, researchers are looking to translate the complex scientific data they're collecting into a form that can be used by ordinary people being affected. Like a daily weather report, seasonal forecasts won't always be accurate. Of course, what everyone would really like is to say, what day will it rain and how much will it rain? And, uh, you know, a very deterministic kind of forecast. So one of the challenges that we're, we're dealing with is really how to uh, communicate this kind of probabilistic information, how to use it. It really boils down to trying to say, you need to see that there are several possible scenarios for how the next season, let's say, will, will evolve. Um, and this one is more likely than that one, but anything could, all, all of them could happen, so you need to think about a decision strategy which kind of hedges the bets. The trouble with, with global warming research is it's going to take a long time to verify whether our hunches are correct. Some of us will be dead by the time we find the answer. It's, it's really early days. When you meet climate scientists and their conferences, I'm always interested to see that their debate is about we need more data, we need to understand better how climate works, more satellites. And we realize we need more communication. We need to understand better. We people on the ground, local people, governors, people who take decisions about infrastructure, about where to build a school, where to build a hospital. We need to understand climate. You don't need to be rich to be well-informed and well-prepared. In this community center in Vietnam's Mekong Delta, women are discussing the potential damage new floods will bring based on the experiences of the past. These people don't want to leave their homes and land. But through discussions like this, the dangers are better understood and together with local Red Cross volunteers, they can develop effective coping strategies for the future. <laughs> 
Floods come every year to the Mekong Delta, but they're getting worse. Not only is there now more water, but it also comes at unexpected times. In 2000 and 2001, the floods were particularly severe, resulting in the deaths of more than 900 people. Over 650 of them were children. Building schools rugged enough that they can double as storm-resistant refuges is a highly effective strategy, saving thousands of lives each year. This is one of a hundred recently built. In preparation for the coming flood season, the Vietnam Red Cross is training a network of volunteers, school teachers and children in disaster preparedness. So far, over 2,250 teachers and 100,000 children have been trained across the 12 Mekong River Delta provinces, dramatically improving the disaster preparedness measures they and their family can adopt during floods. Knowing what to do is one thing, but to be truly effective, you also need to know when a disaster will strike. You can make the forecasting tools more effective, and in order to do that, you have to sort of poll the populations. You have to ask them, what it is that they would like these tools to do for them. The scientists shouldn't assume that they can put these things in forms that are immediately usable and understandable. They need to establish communication with the potential users and to ask them what it is that they would like to see. Bangladesh has a long experience of bringing together all these aspects. Pioneers in the building of multi-purpose cyclone shelters, the country has developed an extensive cyclone preparedness program, employing over 33,000 volunteers, whose task it is to protect the 11 million people living in the lower delta. In a country with low literacy and little mass media, one of the most effective ways of getting the message across is through community theater. As is usual, before disaster strikes, it's a day like any other. The heart of the system is a tightly organized radio communication system. Coordinated from a headquarters in Dhaka, the network consists of a combination of HF and VHF radios and covers most of the high-risk cyclone areas. As soon as a depression is formed in the Bay of Bengal, word goes out to the more than 3,000 local units ready to spring into action. Each unit covers around two square kilometers and is responsible for two to three thousand people. Warnings are made almost door to door using megaphones, hand sirens and public address systems. Once the situation turns serious, the order is made for evacuation. Though a lot of fun is had by all here, these performances are very effective. During 
the 1990s, 140,000 people were killed in Bangladesh through storm and flood. But the cyclone preparedness program evacuated and sheltered more than 2.5 million, almost certainly saving many of their lives. I'm going to go to the next one. 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 i to an inspiring example of how ordinary people, with the help of modest resources, can have a huge impact. Ultimately, it is people that matter. It is only people who can make a difference in our shared future. But to make a difference globally, we'll need not only to prepare ourselves for the changes ahead, but also look at tackling the causes. We all can do something, you know, even every individual can be conscious about how they consume goods, how we consume uh, fossil fuels, how we uh, consume the kinds of products that we buy. Do we need to buy products that are imported from very far away? Let's try to think more locally and consume more locally, and that will help. Political leaders change every four years, but if the opinion of the voters is constant and doesn't change, and if they say, that they're concerned about this, that they don't want the world to become the victim of climate change. And if they keep that message going, then the political powers that be will get the message and will take the decisions that are needed to do something about it. By taking simple, practical measures to protect themselves against calamity, families like that of DMs can arm themselves effectively against the vagaries of the weather. When floods struck Vietnam in 1999, only one out of 2,450 flood-resistant homes built by the Red Cross collapsed. We are learning to be better adapted for today's increasing climate variability, but we still have a long way to go. Higher dikes and bigger reservoirs are not the only answers. We can take advantage of the protection offered by healthy natural systems. We can learn to use what limited fresh water we have more wisely. Medium and long range forecasts will continue to get more accurate, but they will never be perfect. Mother Nature will always have new surprises in store for us. Adaptation is not just the responsibility of governments. It's everybody's business. In cities, villages and rural communities across the world. Typhoon and flood shelters for vulnerable communities in high-risk areas in Bangladesh and Vietnam have saved many lives. We can't prevent disasters and the effects of climate change will get worse before they get better. But by being better prepared for the effects of today's climate variability, we'll be much less vulnerable to the impacts of tomorrow's climate change. The outlook for the future depends on whether we act or not. Uh, in terms of, of the global climate, global ecosystems, if we don't change the way we're behaving, we will have disaster on this planet. If we do change, we can build resilience, we can learn to manage the resources we've got now, to deal with the climate variability we've got now, we can build a, a world that will be a safe place to live in in the future, in spite of climate change. <laughs>